Welcome to the FASA webinar, Reducing Regulatory Burden in Animal Research, Recommendations for Change. We still have a few people logging on, so we'll begin in a few minutes. So please stand by. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, you have joined the FASA webinar, Reducing Regulatory Burden in Animal Research, Recommendations for Change. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, today, Dr. Kevin Craigle and Dr. J.R. Hayward are going to discuss the issue of regulatory burden in animal research and how a collaborative effort between four organizations and many expert participants resulted in a report providing actionable recommendations to reduce burden. We will start the webinar with a bit of background on what FASIB is, briefly describe the issue of regulatory burden and where it can be found, provide an overview of our workshop and report recommendations, describe ways that you can weigh in on the issue should you desire, and have a question and answer period at the end of the formal presentation. At that time, we will try to address as many questions as possible. On the housekeeping front, we would like everybody to know that the webinar is being recorded so that you can review it at a later date or share with colleagues who are unable to participate today. Uh, we do have everybody on mute to eliminate any background noises, but that shouldn't interfere with your ability to ask any question. Uh, to ask a question, uh, you should see a box in the upper right hand corner of your computer screen that looks like the image on, on the screen in front of you. Um, if not, you may just see a small orange box with an arrow. If you see that, click on the arrow to expand the box. To ask a question, simply type your uh, question in the white box that says write question here and then click the gray send button. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar or wait until the end of the formal presentation. And as I mentioned, we will try to get as many, get to many as the questions as we can. So just for background, for those who may be unfamiliar with FASIB, uh, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, or FASIB, is comprised of 31 scientific societies, and we collectively represent over 130 researchers. Our <clears throat> mission is to advance health and welfare by promoting progress and education in biological and biomedical sciences through service to our member societies and collective advocacy. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see the logos of all 31 of our member societies whose support and collaboration are essential to FASIB's work. Many of those joining us today are members of one or more societies, and we thank you. For those who may not be members, we encourage you to join to receive access to additional FASA benefits and society benefits. Interestingly, animal research is one of the core issues that brought together the original FASIB societies together over 100 years ago. And today, many members of FASIB societies are involved in the humane use of animals in research and education. Similarly, regulatory burden is a common issue that unites our member societies. I'm now going to hand it over to J.R. Haywood to discuss the issue of regulatory burden and where we can find it. Thank you, Ann, and good afternoon, everyone. So what are the administrative and research-related uh, regulatory burdens? And what, what can we do about it? This has been a topic that has received a, a lot of attention from associations, the National Science Board, agencies, and National Academy of Sciences. There have been surveys, there have been studies, there have been assessments, 
there have been recommendations, there have been concerns, there have been discussions. And, and many of these uh, uh, vehicles for, for these discussions uh, are shown in, in this slide. But the overriding consistent theme that uh, has been that regulations are important to protect research subjects and researchers against hazards in the laboratory. Unfortunately, along the way, extra administrative work has been added without adding further protections. Approximately 20 years ago, an NIH report on reducing regulatory burden was published, and it identified similar concerns to those raised by um, uh, the National Science Board, by FACIP, and, and the National Academies reports. There has been some efforts to reduce burden, and a really good example is uh, the National Institute of, of Institutes of Health for 2014 notice permitting certain protocol changes to be handled administratively according to IACUC reviewed and approved policies in consultation with a veterinarian authored, uh, authorized by the IACUC. For those institutions that have adopted this approach, I think many have found that it, it's a good way to reduce burden. Well, now we, we are optimistic that the community is at the point that the need for action is recognized by everyone. And this was helped pointed, uh, this was pointed out uh, with the help of um, the workload survey uh, by the Federal Demonstration Partnership. And it really got people focused on the, on the issue. So, and if I could have the next slide. So, um, the Federal Demonstration Partnership is an organization of federal agencies and institutions that receive federal research funds. Uh, agency representatives, uh, research administrators from um, uh, research institutions, and faculty from research institutions work together to reduce administrative burdens associated with federally sponsored uh, research. The faculty workload survey in 2012 was actually the, the second survey that the FDP conducted. The first survey in 2005 was of over 6,000 federally funded investigators. The 2012 survey polled over 12,000 investigators. And the goal was to determine the impact of federal regulations and requirements on the research process. Well, the results of that poll shown in, in uh, this slide, and, and this is the number that got people's attention. 42% of principal investigators estimated time that they spent on research grants that were federally funded were spent on administrative and regulatory tasks. So 58% then, they were able, of their time, they were able to devote to research of 42% to the administrative tasks associated with the research. And this encompassed a very broad range of activities um, from pre-award to post-award. Well, those investigators who responded to the survey, shown in the next slide, um, that did animal work, um, as the uh, survey drilled uh, uh, a little more deeply with questions, we found that nearly 80% of those individuals doing animal work indicated that the administrative aspects of protocol uh, completion, protocol amendment, uh, protocol um, um, changes, uh, took a substantial amount of time away from active research. Well, all these findings of this survey then um, attracted people's attention. And that resulted in, in all the various uh, reports that, that we have seen in recent years. Next slide, please. I'd be remiss if we didn't point out that um, 
there is also a component of self-imposed regulatory burden. Institutions have developed complex schemes to implement uh, best practices or to interpret policies and procedures that go beyond federal, state, and local regulations. Um, and with, without always benefiting uh, the animals. Now, this uh, webinar is not going to focus on this particular topic, but we may tackle it at a later date. So uh, today we will remain focused on uh, on the report that uh, um, we're about to discuss. Anne? Thanks, JR. So um, I'm going to uh, describe the uh, process leading to the report that was generated and disseminated. The impetus for us uh, to organize a workshop initially and to come up with some recommendations for reducing regulatory burden came from the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act. And uh, we'll touch on that with the next slide. Uh, the 21st Century Cures Act received significant bipartisan support in Congress and was signed into law by President Obama in December of 2016. Its goal was um, to accelerate the discovery, development, and delivery of 21st century cures. Now the law is, is quite lengthy. If you've looked at it, you appreciate that, and it has multiple components. So one portion of particular interest to FASA is section 2034 of the law, which is entitled Reducing Administrative Burden for Researchers. Uh, and that's described on the next slide. Uh, this uh, section 2034, the, especially the subsection D, which is listed here, is um, a mandate that the heads of the National Institutes of Health, the United States Department of Agriculture, and the United States Food and Drug Administration, Administration review regulations and policies related to the care and use of laboratory animals. As you can see on the slide, these agencies are to make revisions to reduce administrative burden while maintaining the integrity of research findings and protecting research animals. So that's codified in the law. Um, next slide, um, the, the specifics of the law uh, relevant to this discussion are that the NIH, USDA, and FDA are directed to identify ways to ensure that these regulations and policies are not inconsistent not overlapping and not duplicative. And then these agencies are tasked with taking steps to eliminate or reduce any overlapping or any overlap or duplication in, in these policies and regulations. Also, the agencies are tasked with improving the coordination of regulations and policies with respect to research with laboratory animals. During their deliberations, they are to seek the input of experts as they see appropriate. Next slide, please. So uh, because of this language in the law stating that NIH, USDA, and FDA should seek the input of experts, we thought it would be an opportune time to get experts together to identify the burdens they face in the research landscape, animal research landscape, and think of ways that we could reduce the excess burden while certainly maintaining animal welfare. And uh, we uh, organized a workshop. This was uh, driven by FASEB, the Association of Medical Colleges, the Council on Governmental Relations, and the no National Association for Biomedical Research. It was held in April of 2017, just four months after the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act. And our goal in this workshop was to identify specific actionable recommendations that NIH, USDA, and FDA could use to reduce burdens to investigators and research organizations and universities. We had about 40 individuals attend the workshop, and many of these individuals and the groups they represented have been thinking about these issues for several years now, as JR alluded to. Attendees included university scientists and administrators, representatives from multiple scientific and professional associations. Uh, there were lab animal vets involved, those who focus on regulatory compliance, IACUC administrators and members, and those from accrediting organizations. The primary concern 
uh, of all the participants was animal welfare. And the workshop yielded an, uh, a wealth of excellent, thoughtful points and uh, discussion topics. The result was a number of recommendations that were included in the report. We initially drafted a report that then got circulated to attendees who had an opportunity to review it and provide comments. And then uh, the final draft, which is attached uh, that you can access, was produced in late summer. JR will uh, now present some of the recommendations that were generated. Thank you, Kevin. So um, the one thing that, that uh, Kevin didn't mention is that as we started work on, on um, identifying areas of regulatory burden, we had a single guiding principle um, for all the recommendations in this report. And, and that guiding principle was that no recommendation would compromise animal welfare. We had to maintain the protection of animals as we uh, move forward. So that, that was our, our touchstone throughout the day. After a lot of deliberation, as Kevin referred to, um, this group came up with 20 concrete recommendations. And this was over a period of, of several months. Recommendations were made to the Office of the President of the United States, Congress, the National Institutes of Health, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We distributed the document widely to those in positions to implement the changes, including staff in the Executive Office of the President, the Office of Management and Budget, agency leadership, OLA and APHIS, APHIS leadership, and members of Congress who have expressed interest in reducing regulatory burden. Let's get into the, uh, so, to some of the recommendations. We're, we're not going to cover all of them today, but we'll highlight several. First, to the office of the, of the president. An overarching recommendation uh, from the group was for um, the office of the, of the uh, uh, president and the office management budget to explore consolidation of animal research under a single federal office or entity with one primary set of regulations and guidance documents. A single federal office could be charged with overseeing this consolidated regulatory framework and an arrangement comparable to how federal policy for protection of human subjects, that is the, the common rule, is overseen by the uh, Health and Human Services Office for Human Research Protections. The structure could be based upon U.S. government principles for utilization and care of vertebrate animals used in testing, research, and, and training, since all government agencies adopt uh, these principles. And such a structure could significantly, or at least potentially significantly, reduce administrative work at the federal, institution, and individual levels by harmonizing the requirements across all agencies and eliminating gaps in oversight. Next slide, please. Well, agency requirements, sometimes issued as suggestions or recommendations, are based upon interpretive notes, policies, procedures, uh, terms of awards, uh, FAQs, webinars, journal articles, guidelines, a myriad of, of different ways. And they constitute a significant driver of administrative burden associated with animal research by having all of these different approaches. These kinds of materials have proliferated over the past decade and have become de facto regulations. In most cases, there is no input from the research community or adequate analyses of outcomes such as costs, actual impact on animal welfare, and scientific implement, you know, implications. So we therefore suggested uh, that agencies be required at least a 60-day comment period on the merits and impact of any proposed policies, 
guidance documents, frequently asked questions or interpretive rules before they are issued. And final policies and guidance should include material changes that reflect your main comments received from the regulated community. Now, all guidance documents should also state clearly that they do not carry legal or regulatory force. And the guidance documents should not be accompanied by a requirement to obtain agency approval for alternative methods and or processes. Next slide. We made a few significant uh, recommendations for Congress. Uh, we'll discuss two here. The first has to do with IACUC inspections. So the Animal Welfare Regulations and the Health Research Extension Act have been around for about 30 years. And over that time, we have gotten better at correcting things in facilities when we see them. So in general, semi-annual inspections and program reviews rarely identified big programmatic concerns that would have not already been identified by animal care or veterinary staff during routine daily checks. However, semi-annual inspections are a considerable time commitment for IACUC members, the majority of whom are faculty and investigators and they uh, who are required to visit all animal study areas and animal facilities as part of the inspection. Now for, for some large institutions, weeks and even months are involved to schedule and complete the inspections and significant hours of effort to review the program and finalize the report. And when we typically see minimal findings come from this report or these reports, you know, it raises the question of how valuable are they? So the recommendation that grew out of this discussion was that the Animal Welfare Act and the Health Research Extension Act should be amended to require only annual inspection by the IACUC. Such a change is not intended to negate or minimize the expectation for IACUCs to assess and assure compliance with federal requirements regarding the welfare of animals used in research, teaching, and testing. We just believe that this is an ongoing process and doesn't just occur twice a year during semi-annual inspections. The second recommendation has to do with the USDA inspection. The Animal Welfare Act requires the secretary to, uh, to inspect each research facility at least once a year and more often, if necessary, until all deficiencies and deviations from standards are corrected. Since the enactment of this legislation, the research community has again shown a commitment to compliance and the Animal Welfare Act requirements. The majority of citations issued to research facilities tend to involve administrative issues and not those issues involving animal care. So our recommendation is to amend the Animal Welfare Act to remove the requirement for annual USDA inspection of research facilities and allow for an inspection frequency based on compliance history. A risk based inspection process incorporating compliance history would significantly improve the inspection process both in terms of efficiency and effectiveness and would allow the USDA to allocate its resources where they are needed. Next slide, please. Well, we also have some recommendations to the National Institutes of Health. And the first one um, has to do with congruence of, of grants and protocols. The language in the Public Health Service Grants Policy, the verification of approval, uh, states it's an institutional responsibility to ensure that the research described in the application is congruent with any corresponding protocols approved by the IACUC. Now, while differences appear to occur uh, on a fairly rare basis, 
the requirement places emphasis on the comparison of two documents that are written at very different times, potentially up to nine months apart. A grant is written and submitted, and then a protocol for work uh, associated with that grant could be submitted under just in time, uh, just before the, the work occurs after the grant is actually funded. Now, this difference in timing does not account for changes in technology and advances in science during the intervening period um, or throughout the funding period of the grant. Yeah, rather, we have, we have learned over time that through amendments, and modifications to protocols over the lifetime of the study, all work conducted under public health service funds is covered um, by an approved protocol. In other words, there are ongoing, ongoing mechanisms, mechanisms. To, to ensure that um, the, the uh, work that is um, conducted by investigators is approved. So our recommendation is to eliminate the requirement for verification of protocol and grant congruency in NIH uh, public health service and NIH grants policy to allow for reasonable advances, discoveries, and other developments and overall research objectives. The next recommendation um, deals with the uh, reporting of noncompliance. In 2005, NIH issued guidance outlining when noncompliance must be promptly reported. Dual purposes are identified for prompt reporting. Uh, one, to ensure that issues uh, affecting animal welfare are addressed and corrected. And two, monitoring uh, institutions' animal care and use program oversight under the PHS policy, evaluating allegations of noncompliance and assessing the effectiveness of PHS policies and procedures. Since the issuance of this guidance, institutions have been required to routine, routinely submit noncompliance reports, even when there is no negative impact on animal welfare. So we are recommending that um, this policy be revised, and the NIH uh, guidance regarding prompt reporting include only those incidents that jeopardize the health and well-being of animals. In other words, there would be a, a uh, potentially a tiered reporting process. The next recommendation has to do with the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals as a regulatory document. PHS policy requires institutions to use the guide as the basis for developing and implementing an institutional animal care and use program. Compliance with more than 40 must statements in the guide regarding the animal care practices is required, as is compliance with several hundred should statements. Now, although there is no statutory or regulatory basis to consider advisory statements mandatory, OLAW's FAQ C7 states that deviation from a should statement with IACUC approval is a departure from the guide and must be reported in the semi-annual report to the institutional official. This requirement does not appear to be totally consistent with guide language that defines a should statement as a strong recommendation for achieving a goal. Guide authors further recognize that individual circumstances might justify an alternative strategy. So our recommendation is that the guide is not a regulatory document and was not meant to be. And given that, OLAW should use the guide as it was intended, namely to assist institutions in caring for and using laboratory animals in ways judged to be professionally and humanely appropriate. Further, we recommend that OLAW should revise its policies to ensure that IACUC approved alternative strategies from should statements in the guide 
are not deemed as departures or deviations. This approach would let us use the guide as the kind of supplementary uh, guiding document it was meant to be, while significantly reducing administrative burden, all without compromising animal welfare. For the USDA, there are also recommendations. And the first had to do with protocol review. And it's pretty straightforward and consistent with the mandate in the 21st Century Cures Act to harmonize um, approaches among agencies. So the Animal Welfare Act regulations um, are inconsistent with PHS policy. So our recommendation is to revise the Animal Welfare Act regulations so that IACUCs conduct continuing reviews at least once every three years instead of yearly, as it is now done. This would make review frequency consistent with public health service policy and reduce burden. These protocols are looked at with some frequency anyway, as amendments um, and modifications are uh, added to them. So it, it, it's not that uh, the protocols would only be looked at every three years. The second issue is, uh, regards policy 14 of the USDA policy manual. So currently, researchers cannot perform multiple, major multiple survival operative procedures on the same animal in an unrelated study, even when multiple years have elapsed between procedures or when multiple protocols are involved. This limitation, which, which is specific to the United States, conflicts with efforts to replace, reduce, and refine animal research. It actually in, can increase the number of animals that are used. Uh, there are many instances where repeated procedures have minimal or negligible animal welfare implications and would be the best option under the three R analysis. So better outcomes for animals might even be achieved. And we believe IACUCs should have better access to these options so long as animal welfare takes priority. So our recommendation is to revise USDA Animal Care Policy 14 to allow approval of multiple survival operative procedures at the discretion of the IACUC and as justified for scientific and animal welfare reasons. So the final recommendation on this uh, slide has to do with policy 12, or the literature search requirement. With the Animal Welfare Act covered species, the principal investigator must consider alternatives to any procedure likely to produce pain or distress in an experimental animal. The animal welfare uh, regulations require the IACUC to determine whether proposed animal use activities meet various requirements, including verification that the investigator has considered alternatives to procedures that may cause more than momentary or slight pain or distress to the animals, and has provided a written narrative description of the methods and sources. Uh, used to determine uh, that alter alternatives were not available. Neither the Animal Welfare Act nor the regulations require the use of a database literature search to look for uh, alternatives. So our recommendation is to amend the language in USDA uh, Animal Care Policy 12 with respect to consideration of alternatives so that a written narrative description of the methods and sources would suffice. So the final slide uh, um, in, in this section has recommendations for the National Institutes of Health and the USDA. And, and the first recommendation um, 
provides a, a greater focus on oversight in areas with higher potential for risk um, to ensure animal welfare and allow, and allow investigators to devote more time to research. This concept is consistent with human su uh, subject research regulations. And applying the human subject regulatory framework for exempt research and expedited review to animal research would mean that studies with little risk could be processed more expeditiously. And veterinarians and IACOC members could spend more time on studies with higher risk potential. So the recommendation is to establish a risk-based process for review of animal research protocols, similar to that for human subjects. Then the final recommendation is to establish and appoint an external advisory group of experts engaged in animal research to assist in the review of regulations and policies as required by the 21st Century Cures Act. Now, as mentioned in, in this presentation, over the past several years, the scientific community has made a number of recommendations, multiple reports, um, and lots of opportunities for discussion. So such an external advisory group could be similar to the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protection, SACAR, that occurs on the human side, to um, help agencies um, navigate through the um, complexity in interpreting and uh, in interpreting many of these rules of regulations. So with that, um, you know, this is not uh, all of the recommendations. Um, however, I encourage those who have not looked at the report to, to take a look. Uh, you can download a copy of it by clicking on the box to the right of your screen. Um, and uh, enjoy the reading. Thank you. Okay, so this is Anne again, and I'm gonna um, briefly discuss with you how you can get involved and provide your thoughts and comments to the agencies working on reducing burden. Um, the first opportunity comes from the NIH, USDA, and FDA working group that was established to implement the CURES mandate to reduce burden. Led by the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare at NIH, this group will be releasing a request for public information um, with respect to reducing burden. They anticipate that it will be released in the spring. Um, and um, I encourage those who are interested in making comments to do so. Um, to keep up to date on their efforts, you can uh, sign up to receive news directly from OLA um, through their RSS feed, uh, their listserv, or by following them on social media. Uh, you can see on the box in the slide there are uh, websites that you can go to and Twitter handles that you can follow to more closely follow what uh, uh, OLA and this group is doing. In addition, um, they will be hosting additional uh, listening sessions throughout 2018, um, and they held their first one on January 19th, which was well attended. In addition to the efforts to reduce burden through the 21st Century Cures, USDA, back in July of 2017, released their own request for information. This was a broad request for information, specifically asking the public for ideas on regulations, guidance documents, or any other policy documents that are needed in reform. And this was a USDA-wide uh, request. Um, they were specifically looking for ideas to modify, streamline, expand, or repeal such regulations and documents that may be burdensome. This RFI uh, will be open for an extended period of time. Uh, when they initially put out this request, there were four comment periods announced for those who wanted to provide uh, their thoughts. The two have already passed. However, there are two that are occurring in the future, one on February 12th and one on July 17th. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's a, a, um, a website uh, with a link to the regulations.gov website 
where you can submit your comments should you choose to. Finally, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service at USDA will be holding their own listening sessions. A number of sessions throughout the country will be held to solicit comments to help APHIS in developing criteria for recognizing the use of third-party inspection and certification, certification programs as a factor when determining inspection frequencies. On the slide, you can see when and where the next sessions will be held. Um, one that was held in uh, Santa Clara, California has already passed, but there are uh, three more sessions and an additional session that was added um, to the schedule on March 12th to be held in Columbus, Ohio. In addition, they uh, will be having a virtual session where um, anybody can phone in to provide comments. For more information, you can use the web address at the bottom of the slide to uh, read through the Federal Register Notice. So now I'm going to pass it back to Kevin to discuss what next steps we will be taking um, with the report. All right, thank you, Anne. So uh, wrapping this up, the plan is to uh, use this report and the recommendations generated when presenting public comments at these upcoming USDA listening sessions that Anne just referred to. Uh, the report recommendations will also be presented at the 2018 IACUC Priminar meeting uh, that will be coming up this spring. And committee members and their respective organizations will continue to meet with agency leadership and congressional and OMB staff on issues that are included in this report. And back to you for questions. Thank you. Um, so this uh, ends the formal presentation and now we will move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the white box on the right and click the gray send button. We have had a couple questions that came in during the uh, presentation. Um, the first question is, can you please make the presentation available? That's an easy one? Sure. Um, <laughs> the, uh, if you have registered for the, the webinar, you will see, receive a follow-up email that will have a link to the um, archived um, webinar, which you can watch at any time. Um, another question. Does the CURES legislation provide any guidance on who should be appointed to the external advisory group of experts who are supposed to review the regulations? JR? Ooh, uh, CURES legislation for the external experts, no. Um, I don't believe it does provide specific um, guidance it uh, only leaves the agencies the option to um, um, seek the input from um, external experts. I believe that's the situation. Okay, uh, another question. How do you envision a unified approach to the overseeing of laboratory animal research? Uh, do you have any ideas on what agency or entity you might think should oversee it, or how do you envision that to take place? Um, so I assume this is mine again. Um, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, you know, this, this idea has um, has been out there. It. Um, it was also suggested in the National Academy Regulatory Burden Report. But both documents and, and the discussion group in April steered clear of uh, which agency um, should, uh, should take the lead on this. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, there's a great deal of discussion that needs to occur in the, in the community, in the very broad community to uh, um, see how, how this should take shape. Um, you know, so before we can get to any single agency being involved, I, I think um, that discussion needs to, to occur with respect to, to how this is done. But, um, you know, at the same time, I think there, there is great value in having this discussion because we have a very, very complex oversight system involving multiple agencies. And 
that complexity uh, tends to uh, lend itself to not only confusion, not only regulatory burden, but the potential for being out of compliance. And um, everybody wants to do the, the right thing. They, they want to make sure animals are well cared for and um, they want to make sure that their institution remains in compliance. So, um, you know, I, I, the idea is still in its infancy, but um, it may be an idea whose time has uh, come around the corner in terms of efficiency and the effectiveness of oversight. Okay, um, another question that just came in. When is the government charged with making some final decisions? Um, I can take that one. Um, I believe in the 21st Century Cares Act, um, there's a requirement for these recommendations to be um, put out within two years from um, enactment of the bill. So the 21st Century Cures Act was put into law in December 2016. So we should see, I would think, recommendations sometime um, by the end of this year, December 2018. Okay. Um, another question, where can I get a copy of the report that these recommendations are based on? Um, there are a number of places you can uh, find the report. I believe there is a uh, box on the side of your screen. Um, there should be a, a, a handout that is attached to uh, the webinar screen that you can download from there. You can also go to FASB's website um, and download it from there. Um, if you're still unable to find it, you can email uh, the FASA uh, portal and we can uh, certainly get you a copy. Um, here is another question. Um, I remember reading that the 21st Century Cures Act also required the development of a research policy board. Uh, could you explain that a bit and also do you know what the progress is on the research policy board? Sure. Um, so the, you're correct, the 21st Century Cures Act does call for a research policy board um, under the, uh, to be created under the auspices of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, it is my understanding that uh, OMB is working on that now, and um, while we're not uh, close to, uh, to having it implemented, um, there are a lot of discussions going on at M OMB uh, with outside associations and uh, to some extent with, with agencies uh, concerning the membership and um, uh, how the board will be uh, comprised and, and function. Um, this idea grew out of the um, um, National Academy report that was released in 2016. And, and the vision of the Research Policy Board was, you know, I'll say basically twofold. One, to provide a, um, uh, a venue to discuss um, uh, problems in implementing uh, regulations in um, uh, dealing with the, the regulatory environment, but also to anticipate um, those issues down the road that, that may uh, cause regulatory concern. So um, th this is an extremely important concept and, and one that I think uh, would behoove uh, OMB to, to get established and, and get moving with. Um, so that uh, uh, the the parties that are involved will be able to to start sorting out uh, some of its mission. So I I think that's about where we are now. We're we're part way down the road, but we're not there yet. Okay, um, this isn't so much a question, more of a comment. It says the absence of findings during semi-annual review does not indicate unnecessary oversight. Rather, this is an indicator of the success of these programs. If pursued, these changes should take into account, account large versus small animal-based programs. Large animals would require more oversight. 
Uh, thank you for that comment. Yeah, I think that's very well stated, Anne. Thanks. Right, and I, I would add that uh, that is uh, really part of the spirit of these recommendations is to, in some ways, assess where there are greater needs. And by eliminating some of the redundancies and some of the burden, that will certainly allow um, staff more time to uh, deal with risk-based processes, uh, those cases or situations where there's higher potential for risk. And so it frees up uh, lab animal veterinarians and their staff to devote more time to some of these circumstances that, that were just described. All right, um, another question. Um, have report authors met with any of the agencies uh, such as NIH or USDA that are working on the 21st century cures, mate, cures mandate to discuss the recommendations? Um, if so, what was their reaction to the recommendations? No. Um, well, so I, I don't know if uh, all 35 people have met with different agencies, but uh, or with the agencies at different times. Um, we were certainly at the, the first listening session um, last month in Washington, D.C., and there was some discussion that, that had occurred um, after the, the listening session. Um, we, um, a group of us, also had a telephone uh, uh, conference with the leadership of the USDA and found that to be an extremely uh, productive conversation. And, um, you know, we'll look forward to see what, what happens as the, the USDA moves uh, forward. Uh, we look forward to more opportunities to, to talk with the agencies and um, share our views and, and hear what they have to say. Okay, another question. A follow-up from a previous question. Recommendations need to be made within two years of the act. But what is the time frame for decisions about what changes will be implemented? That, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that um, question, but it's something that we can certainly look into. JR, are you aware of, of the time frame for actually implementing these changes? Um, no, I am not. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, um, the first step was to evaluate for the agencies to evaluate what harmonizations could occur. But beyond that, I, I'm not sure I've seen a, a timetable either. Okay, uh, here's another question. The criteria and approach for the reporting of departures deviations from the AWA and the guide are quite different and confusing between the USDA and LOLA. Is there hope that one consistent guidance approach be achieved as part of this effort? <laughs> well, um, I, I think we're always hopeful yeah. of, uh, of positive outcomes from any discussion. You know, the, the message that, that I've been getting from, from the agencies is they are very hard at work in talking through a number of issues. Uh, we don't know what those issues are, but, but this very well could be one of them, especially after your, your question. So, um, so yes, I'm hopeful, but uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. Okay, here's another question. Do you have any suggestions about how to share the FASA recommendations with university leadership? Uh, leadership often has a greater ability to take action that can help reduce burden than those of us in the lab. I think that's a great question, and I would uh, suggest that um, get a copy of, of the report and share it with leadership at your own university. Um, you can also um, once the, this webinar goes online, you can share the, the archived webinar with them as well. Um, and I think that's a, a great um, opportunity to, to get your leadership thinking about things like this that, you know, we can potentially make change and re reduce burden. Um, 
while maintaining animal welfare. Yeah. And I'll, I'll also add to that that uh, um, we did a presentation to the uh, AAMC grant group, which is comprised of research deans and vice presidents for research at uh, uh, institutions with, with medical schools. So they're certainly aware of this. There was a good discussion. And I know they're doing some follow-up work on um, on the overall topic of regulatory burden so so um, I can also say that um, uh, the double AMC has uh, been made aware of this and, and they've been involved in the, I'm sorry um, the AAU has uh, been made aware of this and um, they've been involved in in discussions related to regulatory burden and their leadership. Um, and, and then finally, um, organizations of vice presidents for research have uh, been discussing this topic. So many of them uh, likely have received a copy. If not, as Sam said, uh, feel free to share a copy with uh, your institutional leadership. Um, here's a question, um, but this is related to uh, self-imposed burden. Um, is there any document available with recommendations for institutions to reduce self-imposed burden? Um, yes. Um, my uh, uh, colleague, uh, and uh, the first one that comes to mind is one that, that we've written, my colleague, uh, uh, Molly Green, and, and I wrote a paper about 10 years ago that's still um, in print and being circulated out there that, that provides a guide. Um, there has been a whole lot of discussion. So there may be meetings, proceedings, um, you know, that uh, have taken this up. Um, and Kevin, do you know of any other specific documents? No, I'm not aware of oh. any others. I, well, I no, believe um, there, was there, there are two or three other published manuscripts. I'm sorry, Stacy Pritt uh, has one that she and, and uh, Molly and, and others have published. And, and I think there are one or two others out there. Um, uh, Joe Tulin um, and uh, his colleagues uh, published a paper a few years ago. So those are three papers that come to mind right away. Um, I'm okay. Sorry, did, did the two of you have any others? Um, I believe you uh, mentioned the one that I was going to mention. Um, I believe it came um, out a couple years ago. Um, I believe it was uh, published in the FASIB Journal, actually. So um, that's there. You're correct. All right, um, so the, okay, here's a, a comment that can answer that question. Uh, COGAR sent out a list of items that can be changed to all uh, their member institutions. So um, COGAR also has um, that information available. Absolutely. And I think, uh, are the number of questions have uh, sort of, come to a stop right now and we are hitting the three o'clock hour. So I will uh, end this webinar and thank you all again for your participation. As I mentioned, the uh, you will get an email um, with a link to review um, the webinar should you choose to at a later date and share with your colleagues. Again, thank you very much for your participation.